Good afternoon, guys. I hope you guys are doing great. This is Sendhil Krishnan from MD Senior Living. We're doing a series of educational webinars. And so I kind of wanted to start, uh, you know, continue on. And we're going to start with chapter two of our webinar series. Uh, give me just a second here to get it set up and go, growing. Um, but you know, the first chapter, and I'll kind of recap, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the webinar for, for that one, but really it was just the background of how I got started into, into RALs and how we chose the first house and kind of proceeded from there and grew the vision app. So I'll kind of tell you what I'm planning on doing for the second one, but at least for the recap, we also talked about the extensive renovations that, that we did on, on that first property, which is the one that you see there. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that webinar, I strongly encourage you to stop this recording, go back and look at it. Thought about doing this live, but unfortunately I've got a very tight schedule coming up this week, um, not just with work, but I'm also gonna be uh, heading out to Scottsdale in a few days. I've uh, got some exciting stuff developing with our own company, some new acquisitions. So I wanted to go in and pop in and check on that, talk to the team. Uh, invite some uh, and kind of invite some of the team members to talk on some of these webinars and give their perspective as well. So got a lot of exciting things planned down the road. Um, but anyway, back to this, if you haven't had a chance, like I said, go back, watch the first webinar. We talked about the first house, uh, the, uh, the renovations and what it took to get it in place. Kind of a little bit about partnership and the vision beyond the first home. And if you remember, I did ask for you guys to do a little bit of homework. Uh, so what was that? One was thinking about your mindset and how you look at risk and opportunity. And this is something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. But you know, do you, do you have a scarcity mindset? Do you have an abundance mindset? How do you generally evaluate how you are in life and how you look at opportunities? So, I gave some recommendations on some books. If you haven't had a chance, please start listening to some of those. I think they're fascinating. And I think they'll make you look at different perspectives. You know? Second thing is I was hoping that you guys would start by visiting some RALs near you. Um, I really would like this to be interactive. I would love to hear from you guys if you did actually go and visit an RAL, what your thoughts were when you saw that. Uh, is this something that you can vision yourself doing, you know? So if you haven't had a chance, you know, there's probably a ton near you. You just don't even know it. So I strongly encourage you guys to go out there and start into that. But the topics that I want to cover for, for this session is really just to understand what the opportunity lies ahead in this baby boomer and senior housing trends, just understanding what's going on with aging in general. Um, wondering if, uh, if your town or city is the right place to get started, or do you need to do, do something like I did, which was go out of state, right? So, and then if you do find that you, you're in a good location, is it the right, where, where in town would you do it? Would you do it on the east side? Would you do it on this side? Would you do it in which, which area? So kind of zoning down or honing down really on the type of neighborhood or part of city that you want to be. So the concept is that over the coming decades, there's gonna be a silver tsunami um, of, of baby boomers coming, okay? So right now, 10,000 people are turning 65 daily. And that kind of equates to 77 million baby boomers coming down the road, okay? 60,000 require, so there's a shortage of at least 60,000 senior housing uh, 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 that we have right now. And really about 4,000 people are turning 85 every day. And the assisted living facility market has just grown and it's projected to continue to grow uh, over time, okay? So the important thing to realize that uh, the baby boomers represents a time frame post-World War II, 1946 to, to about 1964. And these were all veterans coming back after World War II or just making babies like crazy. And so there's an estimate that it's not until 2031 that the oldest baby boomer will turn 85, right? And this is really when 
they are the ones that are going to be requiring assisted living. As people live longer as well, uh, it's the 80s and 90-year-olds that are looking at assisted living. Right? There's other opportunities in senior housing uh, other than assisted living, like independent living, uh, continuing care. We'll talk a little bit about those. But what I'm specifically talking about is assisted living. And we haven't even touched uh, below that, the tip of the iceberg in this. So there's a proverbial floodgate that's coming of seniors down the road. So 2 million Americans will be living in senior care communities by 2030, doubling from 2016. Okay. And it's estimated by 2050 that over a fifth of the population in the US will be 65 or older compared to about 15% now. So the question is, are you convinced that you need to be in the assisted living space? Do you think there's good opportunities there? And the question is, well, the answer is actually the need for assisted living is everywhere, okay? So that's the short answer to our webinar today. So I kind of want you to understand just the basic definitions. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of terms that kind of get used interchangeably when they talk about assisted living. So uh, there's facility-based long-term care services, which include board and care homes, again, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, and continuing care retirement communities. So some of these facility facilities have only housing and housekeeping, but many also provide personal care and medical services. Then there's sp uh, facilities for special programs, like people with Alzheimer's and other dementia types. Okay, so let's look at the first definition, which is board and care homes. These are typically also known as residential care facilities or group homes. They're just small private facilities, usually with 20 or fewer residents. The rooms may be private, but typically they're shared. They receive some personal care and meals and have some kind of staff available around the clock. But nursing and medical care are not generally provided on site. And it's really this typical at-risk senior or seniors needing some type of help or assistance. Oftentimes they may have mental health issues and maybe low income. And this is typically state funded, okay? Assisted living is for people who need help with daily care, but not as much as a nursing home provides. Assisted living can be present in a both residential facility uh, or a larger commercial kind of facility. And you have to be aware of the levels of care that are, that are offered uh, with residents paying more for higher levels of care. So usually these residents can have their own apartments or rooms or share common areas. They have access uh, to many services, oftentimes three meals a day, assistance with personal care, help with medications, housekeeping, laundry, 24 hour supervision, yada, yada, yada. So all these things are typically provided in assisted living. And the arrangements can vary from state to state. Okay, so licensing is a very big topic. It's, it's very state specific, but the generalities are uh, often interchangeable or can cross uh, different states. So we can talk a little bit about that on a, different on a different day. So nursing homes are also called skilled nursing facilities. And of course they provide more focus on medical care than most of the assisted living facilities. Um, so they take their assisted living, but plus some, but not as much as a hospital. Oftentimes they have rehab services. But the thing is like, uh, and then finally, before we get to that, uh, the continuing care retirement communities are basically life care communities. Uh, they offer different levels of services in one location. You know, typically a senior may come in having independent housing, and then may transition to assisted living. And then as their needs worsen or progress, they may transfer into skilled nursing all on the same campus. So healthcare services, recreation programs are also offered. Um, so in a CCRC, where you live depends on the level of service you need. Uh, people who can no longer live independently move to an assisted living facility or sometimes receive home care in their independent living unit. And then, like I said, can transition into, into a nursing home uh, beyond that. So really the lines, though, if we look at it, are kind of blurring between these facility types. As, 
as people live longer and typically don't want to move from one place to another, sometimes you can pull in some of these other aspects from higher levels of care and provide them in the facility, especially if you have physician oversight and ownership. So we can do a lot of things that the lay people really cannot do. So that's why I say these, you know, you can essentially create an assisted living plus kind of home. But oftentimes they provide three levels of care, which I'm, which I'm gonna go through in detail so you kind of understand what these differences are. But, you know, blurred lines, hey, hey, hey. So let's look at supervisory care services. So generally means general supervision, including daily awareness of resident functioning and continuing needs. A lot of it is very hands-off. Um, if the, 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 res, the resident is mostly independent, I would say, in these situations. Um, they, are, they have the ability to intervene in a crisis, uh, but they may need some assistance in the self-administration of medicines. Okay? Personal care is, is activities with assistance with activities of daily living that can be performed by persons without professional skills or professional training. Uh, this includes providing medications, under the supervision of at least a licensed nurse. A facility licensed to provide personal care services may not accept or retain residents unable to direct their own care. So that leads us to the third level of service, which is directed care services. So directed care services mean programs and services provided to persons who are incapable of recognizing danger, summoning assistance, expressing need or making basic care decisions. So within the assisted living model, you have these multiple types of care services that are generally applicable. And you can choose to have all three, you can choose to have the first two or even just one of them. Uh, generally, you're not gonna be doing directed care without the other two because this is a higher level of care. So if you have uh, a licensing for this, you would likely have it for the other two as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, of course we know by now that there's a couple of segments. You're talking about the large assisted living centers typically have at least 50, maybe 100. A lot of them have very nice amenities. I'm not gonna get, uh, lie. I mean, you know, they have access to a lot of entertainment, uh, and, you know, a lot of therapists right on site. You can do a lot of different things for, for your community. However, there, there are some drawbacks and drawbacks is typically you have high caregiver to resident ratios of one to 10 or one to 20. And at night, it can be closer to the 20 mark. So um, level of responsiveness is a real big issue. When you talk to these residents, they'll, they'll often like, that's their biggest complaint. It's like, hey, I pulled the call button and it took like 45 minutes before I could go to the bathroom. You know, sometimes they get so frustrated or their needs progressed so much that typically these residents end up transitioning to RIL communities where you have a much smaller caregiver to resident ratio. And typically, uh, you know, you can actually set it at whatever you want. But uh, if you want to be competitive to other homes, typically the ratio is about one to five or one to six. So that's typically how the caregiver re resident ratio. So typically you have a high level of responsiveness. You can customize meal plans, entertainments. You can do different things uh, that, that uh, often a more uh, personal scale and also kind of helps more for residents that are a little bit more of the direct care, more advanced and need typically more help, okay? So, you know, like when I went through, right? I went and I said that I started I, I transitioned away from California for multiple reasons. And that was really because I just didn't understand what were the opportunities in California. You know, I looked at basic numbers and information that I was getting, and I didn't understand how to do my due diligence in obtaining an RAL or starting from scratch. But I just knew that, you know, generally I was told that, hey, licensing is harder in California. Uh, real estate is, uh, is cost more, labor costs are more, and you can only license up to six beds. And, you know, when I looked at Arizona, a lot of it was just the opposite, except you could also license up to 10 beds. 
So in hindsight, I look back and, and would have really given California much more uh, a fair shake at it and probably would have thought of more about it. Obviously, I'm really happy with, with, with Arizona and how that's turning out. But, you know, I, I don't think you need to worry about wh where, which state you are because I'm pretty sure that there's a need in your own town, okay? And so let's look, but not all towns are created equal, right? If you're in a big city population more than 250,000, I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna be okay, all right? In Phoenix, the population is 1.6 million. There's a ton of residential assisted living. Las Vegas, for example, is 650,000. These are big major metropolitan cities. You're gonna be fine there. If you're in a smaller city, maybe 100 to 250, I think you'll also be fine. Um, you know, Scottsdale is about 250,000 people. Most of our homes are there. Orlando, just a little bit north of that. But, you know, again, ton of care homes in these areas. Uh, so I don't think that's really gonna be an issue. Let's look at large towns, like 50,000 to 100,000. I think you will be okay here. I said might, but I think it's really a bit more than that. But if you're not sure, you can consider getting a market analysis. Uh, but I would also do in some basic research, check the demographics of your town population, how many are uh, uh, seniors above 65 and what that will look like down the road. You know, you can extrapolate that for the next five to 10 years. Um, you know, we're not looking to do these investments just as a one-off um, or just, you know, as a, as a flip, you know, certainly you can do all that, but you want to keep a horizon. You know, if you want to do this right, or if you're really dedicated to this, you want to consider holding it for at least five to 10 years, maybe longer, right? So Edison, New Jersey, 90,000 people of which 13% are age 65 or older. You know, is that a good number? I, I, I don't know. I can't. I can't really tell you that, you know, that's, there's a lot of variables, but obviously there's going to be a need regardless, you know. Now, if you're in a small town, I strongly recommend doing some market research studies and also doing some sleuthing on your own. But, you know, I'll, I'll kind of show you what I mean by all of that here. So when I talk about market uh, analytical research, there's a lot of companies out there that will do research studies to see if assisted living is a good option for your town. They'll give you projections over the next five to 10 years. And some lenders, especially SBA or commercial lenders, if you're going down that road, may actually require you to do this before offering loan products. Um, you know, the cons is it can be expensive. It's, it's, it's not a cheap investment to do to the, these research. Uh, and you want to make sure that it's more specific for assisted residential assisted living and not just assisted living facilities. You know, uh, Grandview Research is one such company. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just providing an example of them. But really, the components of any good research analysis will identify the trends. They'll talk about the pricing strategies as for what, what the competition is doing and what you could be doing. What are the needs? Uh, what could be developed, uh, you know, what kind of a product can you give that'll set you apart, they'll give you feedback on the ground, and just look at your competition analysis, you know. Um, the poor doc method, <laughs> when I started out, this is what I did, so this is very simple to do, and just start by visiting the RALs in your community, right, and I talked about this earlier, and this is one of the reasons that you want to do this, because you can understand what the needs are, what their occupancy are. And you can also kind of figure out what, what, how much their uh, uh, pricing structure looks like. Now, I just want you to be wary when I say bait and switch pricing. What do I mean by that? Um, so, uh, you know, they'll tell you one room rate when really they'll tack on as, as it gets closer for the residents to move in, they'll tack on these extra costs for, so they, they may have a base room rate, which just includes room and board, but then they'll say, well, if it's personal, uh, directed or supervisory, they'll tack on different amounts. 
So you may be quoted 4,000, not realizing that your true cost to move in may be 5,200, which makes a significant difference in your numbers. So if you remember that formula, you take that NOI, um, it essentially take 60% uh, or 70% of the overhead. You can, you can quickly calculate, hey, what is this house generating on an annual basis and does it make sense for me? The other thing is to visit assisted living facilities in the area. So before an assisted living facility is created, they do extensive MRA research, the research analytics. Um, but that doesn't tell you if the, if the, just because there is a facility doesn't mean that it's successful, right? So we need to determine what the occupancy rates are. And my recommendation is not just to go visit and walk around, but really visit during times where you can figure out where there, the most amount of people and residents are there. Right. If you come at lunchtime, really the common area should be filled with residents. And if it's not, then you can kind of get a sense of what the occupancy rates are. Obviously, talking to the staff, giving, bringing them food, you know, just saying, hey, listen, you know, I'm trying to place my grandma here. Like, how many residents are here? They might, they might be able to get some information too and give you an idea of just how competitive or, or how useful, or not useful, but just how. Uh, popular assisted living can be in your facilities. Like I said, if you're in large cities, large towns, you're most likely going to be okay. Um, but even really small towns, what about, what about places like the Ozarks? So the Ozarks is, uh, apart from that show, turns out also my, my parents actually live in the Lake of the Ozarks. So my father's a cardiologist out there. I actually practiced out there myself. So Osage Beach, where, where that town, I mean, where that show is shot is actually a population of 5,000. But they have multiple assisted living facilities, you know. It's not just 5K, though, really. It, the entire Lake of the Ozarks is well north of 75 to maybe about 90,000 people surrounding that whole community. But it's a popular retirement place. You know, there's a bunch of small towns, but collectively, there's multiple assisted living facilities out there, you know. So I think the, the opportunities are bound everywhere. And I think if you have a fantastic product, uh, like that whole adage goes, if you build it, they will come. I think it's really true. Now, within the town itself, you wanna make sure that you're in a good area, right? Not all parts of town are created equal. We all know that with some more desirable than others. So does that mean you plop it in the, in the most expensive part of town? And the answer is no, because it's not probably going to be the best part to place a, a RAL either. Um, the most affluent areas will really have higher real estate prices. They may come with an HOA, which is going to make your life difficult. And I'll talk about a case study there. And, but you can command much higher bed rates if you are able to get in there. But seniors may find ways, you know, to live in their own homes and move into assisted living. So if they're in a really affluent community and they're really well off, um, there's not much incentive for them to move into, into an assisted living home. You know, they're, they may just modify their homes or hire their own caregivers to take care of them at home if they have ways and means to do so. So being in, being in the most affluent area doesn't necessarily mean um, you'll automatically get filled, right? So if I was to select a location, and typically this is where where our homes, the higher, at least the higher end homes, uh, are typically located in this upper middle class area, it's these B plus to A minus homes. Um, so why? Because proximity to family members matter, proximity to airport. Again, keep, keep in mind hospitals, amenities, grocery stores. You don't wanna be in a remote area, uh, regardless of, of, of the kind of area that it is, if you're not close to, to basic supplies, you know. Also, where will your caregivers live? Where, where is your manager going to be living, right? If you're in an app, like super luxurious, affluent, hard to reach area, you have to rely on the staff to get there every day. And really, you know, if you are expanding, you have the ability to share labor, entertainment costs, and therefore you can grow and scale due to economies of scale, you know? So here's another great tip that you can also use is to actually ask referral agencies and uh, placement agents um, 
um, to, uh, to ask their feedback on what part of town is best to get started or where they see demand. You know, you'd be, uh, I'm always surprised when I find out that places even in Scottsdale or Phoenix, they're seemingly only miles apart. One place has huge demand while others do not. So these, these people are on the ground, they're actually placing residents. And so some of the places you can get started with is a place for mom or care.com. You can reach out to the agents there. And really you can, you can start by doing that and talking to them and getting their feedback. And then again, like I said, secret shopping at RILs. Uh, you can also try to join local organizations. You know, some communities have RIL operators uh, that get together or talk on some forum. So uh, being part of that and keep your ears to the ground is, is another good way. Now, obviously many of them are not gonna be um, happy to find out if you're, if you're trying to be competitive to them. But some may, you know, the, the, uh, but if you're reaching out to, to assisted living brokers and you talk to these operators, they'll be happy to tell you, you know, many of them have been in the, in the market for decades and they can tell you what works and what areas do not, you know. So as a, as a recap, right, what kind of property are we looking to get? Again, I would stick to single story properties. Uh, you want to maximize the bedroom potential. Uh, and if the number of bedrooms aren't there, then you want to consider renovation strategies to increase, increase the bedroom count. Uh, being in a quiet neighborhood setting and, you know, having obviously a property with nice curb appeal. Um, so you also, one of the things that you want to think about is parking. So many cul-de-sacs are tight. They really don't offer adequate parking. And the bare minimum that you need is at least three spots. And this is for caregivers, managers, and family. This is an absolute bare minimum. Remember, like if you have an event going on or you know, something going on on holidays, you don't wanna make it frustrating for family members to try to find parking. Um, also, what you wanna avoid is finding a house with two common areas. Because what, what you're going to end up having is a, a set of residents in one side of the house and another set in another side. And now you're going to have to split your caregivers between these two separate locations. And if you only have one, it makes it extremely difficult. And if you have residents in their bedrooms that also need like bathroom assistance or feeding assistance, that just makes it even more worse. So that's why we avoid... Um, two-story houses, because again, you're splitting up the residents. You can't keep a direct eye on them. And again, you want to try to avoid um, areas that, that are too separated and, and too spread out within the home by having different common areas. Finally, avoiding the HOA if at all possible. Now, HOAs cannot stop you from starting an assisted living. It's in the Fair Housing Act, and you can always quote it to them. But that doesn't mean that they won't make your life miserable. They won't find ways to sabotage your project, slow you down by filing lawsuits or whatever it is, or threatening lawsuits. So if you're ready to fight that, then you know go for it. But I don't, I don't think it's really necessary. But I'll kind of give you an example of something where I learned along the way a couple of years ago, which was if you remember in my in my first talk, I talked about an original 1031 exchange. What I, what I didn't tell you guys was that I was actually looking at two separate markets at the same time to start RELs. One was the Arizona market and the second was the Kansas City market. Familiar with the Kansas City, I went to, went to UMKC, go Roos uh, out there. But so I, I started to buy turnkey like rental properties out there, single family. So I thought, you know what, it'd be great. I, could, I met two separate teams, both were interested in RELs. You know, one was in Arizona and one was in Kansas City. And so I thought it'd be awesome. I could have two separate projects going on, diversify my RALs there. Um, so as part of the 1031 exchange rules, you have, I think, 45 days to identify up to three properties. I think I identified two in Arizona and one of them was actually in Kansas City uh, after we did a fair bit of research on, on some properties out there. So this was a property uh, back then, it was about 700,000. It was only a four or five bedroom. So it required extensive renovations to get up to, to uh, a total of 10 bedrooms, I believe. Um, 
the startup operating capital is going to be about 50K. And really, there was actually two ways to do it. I think, uh, for whatever reason, I believe there it, you could have a total of 10 residents plus two live-in caregivers. Or you could have 12 residents and just have shift caregivers with no limit. So you could have three or four or five or whatever number of caregivers because they weren't considered living. So first of all, that, that calculation of having those two extra residents uh, was going to be an extra 100K in annual uh, profit. So profit delta was much more feasible and much more uh, lucrative to have extra residents than having living caregivers, right? What would have been the advantage of living caregivers? Uh, saving on, on payroll costs, or say, uh, saving a little bit on, on shift versus living model. So this was the property there. Now you can see that the home value has increased. What I really liked about it is uh, it was, uh, it looked very much like a big estate. It had this huge like curving uh, circle driveway uh, where all these cars could park up there. Uh, it was very nicely well done. It was a little bit outdated, but we figured we would we'd kind of um, update it along the way because we needed to anyway. Well, so what ended up happening was that we couldn't go through with this because after I identified it and we were doing all this work, getting contractors to come in there, look, having architects look at it to figure out how we can get it, maximize the number of bedrooms, we completely kind of neglected the whole HOA thing. You know, we were told that, hey, you can, you can do it in any community with an HOA. But when the team finally approached uh, the HOA and kind of told them our plans of converting it to an REL, we got an immediate hard stop. It was just, hey, we don't want this here. This is not something that we want in our community. It didn't even matter. Like, you know, it's like, hey, these are senior residents. This is not a party house. And I'm not really sure what their reasoning was. We, we went back to them multiple times, went to their actual meetings and trying to explain to them what, what our plan is and what we were doing. And that this is not something that was gonna hurt the community. And so unfortunately, a lot of HOAs and people that are saying that they just don't understand what you're talking about. I think a lot of them fear that this is some kind of sober living or a halfway house or something like that. So they don't necessarily understand what the concept of assisted living. So we went through all that and it turned out that, you know, did we want to go through this legal fight? And it seemed like this HOA in particular uh, was really bent on making sure we weren't going to end up there. And so we decided at the last moment, you know, forget it, right? It's not worth the fight. And then I completely switched out of there and decided to just focus on Arizona uh, going forward, which is why. I proceeded with purchasing the other property. So, you know, we've talked about buying a house from scratch, but what about the concept of acquiring an existing assisted living home? And I just want to go through the pros and cons of that, right? So the biggest advantage is it's already licensed RAL. You got the license in place. The license does not follow the manager or the owner. It follows the house. So as long as the house is there, it can continue to run. As long as you renew the license, you can continue to run it as an RAL. The, the good advantage sometimes is that it already has a good reputation in town. There's already familiarity with the referral sources. So they just understand like, hey, this house is there and uh, a new ownership is taking place. They have residents in place. So it's already hopefully cash flowing uh, before you acquire it. So you already come in with some revenues coming into the operational side. Um, it may have already had renovations done. Maybe it's already been renovated into the maximum number of bedrooms. You know, does further renovations have to be done? So this can be advantage or disadvantage just depending. Um, the disadvantage is that oftentimes you'll be paying a premium on the business side, so probably sometimes more than what it's really worth. Now, it's like buying any business. There's no guarantee that your customers are going to come back and continue to buy, right? There's, there's no, you know, if you buy a, a medical practice, there's always a chance that, that patients, the new, uh, you know, the patients may not like the new physician there and just decide to go to a different, uh, to a different facility. So that, that's certainly a concern when that 
this occurs, you know. Um, you may need more out-of-pocket cash to close, especially on the business side. If, you, if you're not getting a loan on the business side, uh, commercial lenders typically may, may or may not do that. It just depends. And if you're going down the SBA, you may be able to cover some of that capital too. And again, you may need to update it to get it to the full potential. You don't just want to buy a property and just run it at the same level. You want to do something to get it to a higher level. You know, otherwise you may not be able to cover all your expenses because now you're paying more for it. Um, so really your added costs, your revenues have to be larger than what the prior operator was charging. So you have to really make sure that, you know, when you come in, you're adding some value to increase the cost that you're gonna be asking for. And finally, like I said, you know, every time there's a change of ownership, families do get concerned, you know, it's a legit. They've grown to know the owners, they've grown to know the staff, and if they find out someone new is coming, uh, especially if you're not established, they, they, they may pull, pull um, family members out of there into a different home. So you really gotta spend time allaying some of those family concerns, so don't overlook that. Uh, one of the questions I was asked is really, how do you determine the value of an assisted living home? And there's different ways of determining value, okay? So real estate appraisers use three approaches in determining value. Uh, one is income, one is comp sales, and one is replacement cost. But really, the, for most buyers and lenders, the income approach is the most important because you really want to know, uh, it just comes down to whether the income will support the debt service and let you know if the property is financially feasible overall. But one quick and dirty way to determine the value is to use the cap rate formula. So the cap rate formula is essentially the net operating income on an annual basis divided by the current market value of the asset, otherwise the property value, what they're asking for. And that'll give you a percentage known as the cap rate. And um, really, it's the yield that a property produces at a given price, uh, but you do not consider the effects of debt service. So really, you're, you're not taking into account mortgage. Because you know some people may have bought the asset with cash. Other people may be financing it through a bank. So you want to try to equalize that across the board by not worrying about that. That comes later on. And really, the cap rate is, there's a lot of, discrepancy in what buyers and sellers uh, will have an opinion about the right cap rate. You know, buyers will seek a higher cap rate, really resulting in a, in a lower value on the property, and sellers will aim for a lower cap rate, resulting in a higher value. So cap rates for senior care real estate vary depending on the type and quality of the product. Okay. So let's Let's, let's so again, there's, there's, the, um, there's the cap rate formula. And what you can do is you can also uh, uh, reformulate it so that you can determine from a known cap rate in the market what a property value should be or if it's too much or too little compared to that, okay? So really, essentially, as a buyer, you wanna buy at a high cap rate, most value. If you're a seller, you wanna sell at the lowest cap rate most value in selling. Uh, and so cap rates can be used to analyze different deals, se totally separate deals. You know, whether you're buying a Starbucks, you determine a cap rate there versus if you're buying a medical office building, they'll have two separate cap rates and you can determine, hey, based on just that one number, which are these two numbers, which one is better? So this is one of those counterintuitive things, but really with cap rates, you wanna buy at a high cap rate and you wanna sell low. So let's look at a real case example. This is actually something that we, uh, within the last couple of weeks, are actually we're still looking at is, is a property, this assisted living property in North Scottsdale region. One of the things that we always get is a rent roll of what the current residents are paying. And so you can see that total monthly rent rolls, and I've, and I've cut out all the names, um, but you're, you're on this property, they're grossing about 48,000 uh, across the board, okay? And I'll kind of come back to this and we'll kind of dig into this, uh, but what they're actually asking on the real estate is 1.1. Is 1. 1. 
On the business, they're asking for 550,000. Uh, furnitures and fixtures and et cetera, equipment, they're asking for 129,000. So the total ask is about 1.725 million. Um, so it's a little bit discounted from that total price there, but that's what they're, uh, what the seller is offering it at. And really it's a luxury assisted living. It's 10 private bedrooms. It's got 11 bathrooms. It's completely decked out. It's renovated. It's, it's a very pretty property. It's 100% occupied. So is this a good facility to purchase, right? And the NOI, this is a really busy slide here, but really it's breaking down all the expenses. And, and on the top there, you can see that this was from January to December full year, 2020 the full year. And then um, we've only gotten a partial for uh, 2021. But you know, I, I've decided to just use the full year of 2020. And you can see that the NOI is about 81,000. However, they're including the rent payment, which is really essentially their mortgage payment. And if you remember, we're not gonna, we're not gonna utilize that in the NOI. So I'm gonna add that 48,000 back into this 81. And you get a new NOI of 129,000. So this is what this property is generating before paying for any mortgages. So you take that number and you divide it into what they're asking, and essentially you get 0 0.07, which is 7%. So you have that number, is this a good cap rate? And if anyone's in the commercial real estate market, you, you know how cap rates are across the US. They are decreasing, right? So from 2019 to even quarter four, there's been a steady decrease. What does that mean? values are increasing, the, the prices are increasing of the properties that you're looking at. And this is from CBRE data. So this is what we typically looking at commercial um, uh, across the board, any kind of commercial investment facilities. And you can see again, cap rates dropping across the board and, and they have been for you know almost a decade now. So, and this is, um, just a loop net of uh, multifamily apartments, small multifamily units as well. This is very current from today, actually, from loop net. Uh, looking in just Orange County, you can see cap rates are under 4%, under 3% at some times. So very compressed. So cap rates have been compressing. And in most major cities, they're less than 5%. So 7% is, seems like a really good deal, actually. It's pretty acceptable. But the thing is that when we look back at our own portfolio, we were able to acquire properties with cap rates above 11 and 12% recently, which is one of the great things about assisted living because it's one of the few commercial investment opportunities, even though it is still residential, that where you can still get double digit cap rates when you're on the purchase. So let's say uh, we wanted to actually shoot for 11%, say, hey, we don't want to buy this property at 7%. I want to shoot for 11%, okay? Again, you can rework that formula. So basically you would take the NOI and divide it by that cap rate. And really what you would get, the max price to pay, really should be around 1.1, 1.2 million max to get to hit that goal of 11%. Um, so ultimately I, I feel like the sellers are asking far too much on the business side. Uh, does it make sense? I mean, can you? Yes, absolutely. You can still get it. You'll still be getting a deal compared to a lot of commercial real estate investment opportunities out there. But I think there's better opportunities at play. Now, with this particular property, one of my concerns, though, is digging through it, is the fact that you have a wide range of rates going from all the way from 3000 up to about 6000 now, if it was truly luxury assisted living, many of them would be doing private pay of 5,000 plus. So what are we going to do to be able to command more rents to, to justify the higher cost that we have to, have to now pay? So looking at that rent roll, you have to really dig into the numbers because some of these may actually be state funded residents. So if they're putting state funded residents into more of a luxury assisted living, you've got to ask why that's happening. And it's probably because the demand is not so high in this area. 
And actually, I talked to placement agents about this property in this location, and they said the same exact thing. For whatever reason, um, there's not that many residents that that are um, that like to stay or you know or asked about uh, moving into these areas. So nice area though, but it's 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 strange how that works though. But anyway, let's uh, continue on. Um, so when you're trying to get when you're if you're trying to buy an assisted living facility, you wanna you wanna figure out the valuation versus your due diligence. And the important distinction is that if you want to just figure out the value, it's not the same information that you'll need when you're kind of digging in, doing your due diligence. So, and the reason that this is important is because if you're asking for too much information, the seller may be reluctant to share that. Um, he or she may be fearful that you're using this information to compete with them or otherwise cause some sort of harm. So the seller may be very, um, picky about what kind of information they give you. Sometimes that creates fear in the buyers because now they feel like, hey, there's something being hidden about this property. So this own caution can backfire on the sellers and, and a buyer may have actually may backfire on them by passing on an opportunity that would have actually been a gem. So really what you want to do is to get information in the right manner. You don't need everything up front. You need to get it in a systematic manner and to make sure that you're engaged with the sellers of these RILs. The first way is really a lot of these, before you get any information, you'll be asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement, uh, very standard, but just saying that you're not gonna share any of the information that you've gotten. And uh, next is the valuation, right? We talked about uh, how do you get a valuation, but many of this just includes an appraisal, includes income approach, replacement cost, and also comps in the area. Very hard to comp an assisted living facility if one hasn't been sold, or bought or sold or has the same number of bedrooms. But um, certainly feasible to look into those, you know, price per square foot as a simple metric. But, you know, that doesn't take into the fact that you have all these residents that are there with this, with this business as well. Um, so replacement cost, um, financial statements, so really the essential information that I wanna go through. So appraisers, investors, and others will each have their own list of things needed to determine the value. But here's the list of essential things that I've kind of come up with. You want income statements, also known as profit and loss. You want it monthly for the last 12 months. And then you want it for a year to date for the last couple of years, at least the last two calendar years. And why is that? Because you wanna spot trends uh, over recent months and trends year to year, like are they gradually increasing their revenues? Are they stagnant? Are they going down? You know, and that way you can figure out what your projections for future income are gonna be like. Um, income statements by facility. So if they have more than one REL for sale, you wanna make sure that it's, you have uh, uh, separate income statements. Um, sometimes there's list of discretionary, non-recurring or extraordinary items. So things that were major repairs, that have been expensed rather than capitalized. In other words, it's items that may not be applicable to a new owner and shouldn't be considered in the valuation. If it was a one-off thing, you don't wanna to continue to count that as a recurring expense because that will make your NOI look bad. Again, uh, the resident census or rent roll, um, you know, to confirm the actual occupancy rate. What's also important is to figure out what the payer makes. Is it is it state funded or is it private pay? You know? um, so finally, you wanna look at property plans and specs. Uh, just walking through the property, you can figure out a lot of this. You may wanna get a copy of the blueprints. You can take a look at that and see if there's ways to add more space, more bedrooms. Uh, look at the functionality of the house, the efficiency. And again, always think about expansion potential. What would make, uh, what would make sense for this RAL with knocking down a wall or adding an extra bedroom or adding an extra bathroom, what would make more sense? You know, and sometimes asking the caregivers and staff and the residents that are there, they'll be able to tell you what they would prefer in that house if they had just started, you know. Uh, finally, what, what was the, when was the facility built and remodeled? Uh, was it purpose built for assisted living or repurposed? Uh, you look at the age, uh, deferred maintenance, uh, what can you expect down the road? What's been fixed? 
So all of these things. So all of these things, why do I bring this up? Because these are what you're gonna to use to consider, hey, should I buy my first one or should I build my first one? Um, so all these multiple variables. But one of the things that you have to sort of keep in mind is yes, you're spending more when you're purchasing one that's in play, but the time value of money, right? The time it takes to renovate, time to get the license, and then ultimately the time to market and time to fill until it cash flows could be a significant amount of time. And you may actually spend more money wasting that time when you could have actually spent a little bit more and purchased the RIL and had a cash flowing property off the bat. Again, always, regardless of what you do, you want to look for opportunities to increase rents and increase the NOI, which will increase the valuation of your property. Again, you know, uh, when you're buying existing though, you're getting an established RAL that has good familiarity in the community. Whereas if you're starting out, especially with your first one, you're gonna have to start from scratch and make a name for yourself and all the multiple other variables. So as we come to a close, the future topic that I wanna kind of get into, is probably gonna be zoning, permitting, uh, issues there, building codes, a little touch on that. Um, I wanna talk about licensing, give some state specific examples and then some renovation strategies, uh, which we touched on, but I'll probably give an example of another case study of one of our homes. Um, let's uh, talk about the homework assignments that I really want you guys is, have you made plans to visit an existing RAL? If you're not, please do so and kind of think about some of the topics that I've covered when you're looking at these RALs. Um, also, what I'd like you to do as a new assignment is to really reach out to an assisted living broker in your area and pretend you're shopping for an RAL uh, and see, you know, talk, think, think through the due diligence stuff as if you're actually ready to purchase something and what you would ask for. And some of those documents, they'll actually send to you the rent rules, things like that, so you can actually take a look and peek in and see what's going on in your own communities, you know, use, utilize the steps that I did. And finally, um, question for you. And also, yes, if you have seen the RALs or if you do have these, uh, please email me. My email is on the next slide uh, or uh, DM me. I do like to read them. I will respond to them. I just want to know that you guys are engaged and find this productive and useful. But the question I have, and this is what uh, uh, someone reached out to me in email and asked is, uh, how do we know if this is risky for what we're doing? And I want to ask that, pose that question to you guys what makes something a risk versus an opportunity? How can someone look at the same um, investment thing and decide if it's risky or if it's an opportunity? Um, I have my own thoughts about this, which I wanna share at the next topic, the next session, but just beforehand, I just kinda of wanna hear your thoughts too. Again, give me feedback at sendhillk at mdseniorliving.com. I'll do my best to try to respond. I do read every email and DM, however, but I want to thank you guys for your time.